backwards. You are forwards. We can, I can read J5 create just fine. Great. All right. Excellent. That's a good consideration. I don't think I would have thought of that. <laughs> All righty. OK, so we are live. Well, I'll probably pull um, some telescopes are... up to the. Oh, OK. We, you cut out a little bit for a second there. You said you're going to bring some telescopes up to the camera. Is that what you're oh, I'll, I'll drag some telescopes where you might be able to read the numbers. And I just want to be okay. able to um, have the boards and not backwards. Perfect. Sounds good. Hello again, Joseph from Horseshoe Bay. It's great to see you every time. And Phil, who's my boss. Hi, Phil. <laughs> All righty. So we're going to get started because it is 3.30 and, and now is the time. Um, so hello again, everybody. Nice to see you all here. Today we are doing a slightly different kind of session. We're going to be talking about beginner telescopes, which means we're not sharing our screens as much. What we're doing, well, what we're doing, Chris is the one with all the telescopes here. <laughs> so Chris is going to show us a bunch of different telescopes that he has and how to do some setup on them, what each one is good for, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so without further ado, Chris, would you kindly show us all of your telescopes, please? <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Before I, before I jump into the telescopes, let's just... Let me share my screen here and let's... Well, then my immediate... <laughs> it's immediately wrong about well, I'm just, sharing yeah, thing. Okay. I will share my screen from <laughs> time to time. I'm going to... I'm going to demonstrate some things here. Let's see. Share screen. I just want to encourage everybody to head out if they're early risers or at least pay attention if you're up and out of the house at all in the morning, maybe with the dog or something like that is to look in the southeastern sky, the southern sky, southeastern sky, because the moon is doing its monthly trip through the planets in the morning sky this week. So this is the sky this morning. So tomorrow morning, the moon will sit between Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. And then the next day, so that's Thursday. And Friday morning, you've got the moon and Mars. Now, it's not gonna be very visible, but Neptune is there too, let me just, Zoom in a little bit here and see if we can pick up Neptune. There's Neptune over here and another night. So you've got, you know, if you want to do a nice photo series, you can get up if you had a clear sky every morning, you could, you could watch the moon pop through the planets in the morning sky. So I encourage you to do that. That's the uh, sort of big news in astronomy this week. So I'll put Stellarium away here now. But of course, the other big, big news is that uh, the moon is heading into its last quarter phase, so we've got about 10 days of nice dark skies, so it's perfect for thinking about getting a telescope outside and using it. And what I'm going to do here is, let's see, can I full screen? I can stop showing my camera. Let's do it this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going gonna, gonna to run through a couple of basic things and then show you um, a little bit about beginner telescopes. So the, the inspiration for doing this session was that um, I post my astronomy skylight blog to a number of beginner astronomy groups on Facebook. And as a result, I'm seeing the posts from those groups all the time. And they're every day, it's somebody asking, hey, I've picked these two telescopes, which is the better one? Or, you know, can somebody please give me some help as to what to pick? And invariably, I always think to myself, oh, those aren't the ones I would pick. Uh, <laughs> because I know, you know, what to look for. And um, what I've been encouraging people to do lately is going to Astronomers Without Borders. So Astronomers Without Borders is a, is a, you know, a charitable, a giving organization, and they sell telescopes, among other things. And when you buy from them, you're actually supporting their charity, you're getting a good price. Um, I think it's free shipping in, this, in the US. I'm not sure about Canada. That might be in Canada as well. And they have a, a good variety of starter telescopes and advanced telescopes. So, you know, if you're shopping, I would go there and have a look at least, um, at least before making your final decision. So let's put this away. So um, are you seeing my background all right? Let me just get out of the way here a little bit. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So this is, a refract this is how a refractor telescope works. That obviously the light comes in from the stars at infinity, it gets focused by the objective lens and that light, that focused light travels down the tube to the, end, the other end of the telescope where that image is reconstructed. 
Now the focusing is done by the objective lens at the front and the image, the unfocusing is done by the eyepiece at the other end. And I'll show you a variety of eyepieces as we go here. All right, so let me, let me just cover refractors first. Hopefully you can see the telescope all right. We can see you clearly there. All right. So this is, this is not my pride and joy. Um, I do tend to get given telescopes that I then can pay for or pass along to teachers and things like that. So I do have a little stable of what I wouldn't buy if I were shopping today. But it does give me an example of what I can, what I can ask, um, get people to look, look out for when they're shopping. So this is a little, little refractor telescope. As I said, the light comes in the front, travels down the tube and gets focused on the back. And the one thing that I mentioned last week, this is a true story, that I actually had a teacher friend who bought a telescope because we were doing star parties together. And one day she brought her telescope to the star party and she said, can you help me set it up? And I said, yep. And I pulled the cap off the front and she said, I didn't know that came off. I thought I was just taking the little circle off in the middle. And of course, the smaller circle is what you use when you're looking at the moon because the light from the moon travels through your telescope and so much moonlight flooding through your telescope can, can, can ruin your, your, night, your eye vision and, um, sorry, can sort of semi-blind you if you like because mm -hmm. it's so bright. And so a lot of the telescopes come with these subcaps to reduce the aperture for looking at the moon. Some do, but not all, eh, Chris? Yeah, most of them these days seem to have them. So this refractor telescope is what I would call, uh, you know, it's bare bones, basement sort of bargain brand telescope. And I often see people asking about, I've got this telescope for $150 and this one for $150, which should I buy? And sometimes they're even electronic go-to telescopes. And so you have to think to yourself, if it's a $600 telescope on sale for $150, Go for it. But if it's actually a $150 telescope, then they've had to cut corners somewhere. So it's, you know, maybe it's plastic gears or cheap parts or poor optics. So if you really want a good, decent telescope, I would start at the, say, $400 range and up, and then you're bound to get something reasonably good. So this is the kind of thing you'd see at a department store, Walmart, Canadian Tire, that kind of thing. And the problem with this, this type of telescope is it tends to be made out of plastic parts, uh, which will break easily, especially if you've got kids that aren't maybe as, uh, you know, as careful with the way things move. And so you really can um, be a bit of at risk there. But let's kind of break down what this, what's happening here. So we've got the light coming in the front, focused by the objective lens, and then unfocused by the eyepiece at the other end. Now, I've actually had people think that this part is a zoom. This is actually the focuser. So what you do is you take your eyepiece, plug it in to the other end, and the light comes down here, and it actually gets set at a 90 degree angle by this diagonal. This is a, called a star diagonal, and the only reason for doing this is to make it more convenient to look in rather than have to crouch down and slide up the tube. And the other thing, the other job that this diagonal does is normally a telescope will flip the image over and left and right. And this star diagonal will undo the, the upside down flipping. So you'll see a right way up picture when you look through the telescope like this. So you could use this for bird watching or you know, reading signs at a distance, that kind of thing. So that's the star diagonal. Now to focus the telescope, you turn the focus knob but if you want to magnify or zoom in on objects, you've got to switch out to different eyepieces. So the eyepieces, they all have numbers on them. This one's a 25. Can you read that okay? Just a 25 barely. Millimeter, I see that. 25 millimeter. 25 millimeter. Plus there it is, yeah. So the length it takes for the telescope to focus the light is called the focal length of the telescope. And normally that's printed on the side, I don't think you can see that. There's a little plaque on the side that says the focal length of the telescope. In this case, it says the focal length is 700 millimeters or 70 centimeters. And that's roughly the length of the, eye, or length of the tube. This number on the eyepiece is also the focal length. That's the length that the 
uh, eyepiece does to un unfocus and bring it into, a, into an image that your eye can see. And so if you want to change the magnification of your telescope, you swap in the different eyepieces. And generally, they'll come with one or two or three eyepieces that you can put in there. Okay. Now, you may be addressing now, this, but I've just, I've just learned a small amount about eyepieces. And what I've learned is that, let's say you have a 25 millimeter eyepiece, I would have expected the numbers, as the numbers got bigger, the image got bigger, but that is not the case with eyepieces, right? Correct, so it's, it's, it's counterintuitive. And I'll give you the math, I'll give you the formula in a second here. Okay. First, I just and wanna talk for a second about, about focal ratio. So there's a, there's, the telescope will always have the focal length on it written down. It'll always have its diameter, so that's the, the width of the lens. And in this case, this little telescope is 70 millimeters in diameter and 700 millimeters focal length. And when you ratio those two, you get 10. So 700 over 70 is 10. And so the, that's usually expressed on the telescope as an F slash the number. So if, you pick, if you're shopping for a telescope and you see a number like F10 or F12, that's gonna indicate that it's a narrow tube and it's, it's long in length. But the important part is that the focal ratio gives you a sense of how much sky you can see, right? So if you do this mental experiment, don't everybody run and do this right now, but <laughs> if, you take a, if you take a wrapping, a Christmas holiday paper wrapping tube and look at the sky through it, you're gonna see a little patch of sky through it. Then if you take the same diameter tube, but say from a roll of toilet paper, do the same experiment, you're actually gonna see a lot more sky. The telescopes work the same way. So the telescopes that have high F numbers, they see a narrow, small patch of sky. And the ones that have a big F number, a larger F number, uh, sorry, a smaller F number, like six or seven or even five, they're seeing more sky. And so if, you're, if you double the width of that circle of sky you're looking at, you're looking at four times the amount of sky. And so you've got, you're increasing your odds of seeing an object by a factor of four. So if you're trying to see an object and search for it with your telescope, it's easier to do if you have a stubby low F number telescope. So you wanna keep your eye on that number when you're shopping. The other is the, the aperture. So the more, the larger the objective lens, the more light can get in the front of the telescope. And so, the bigger the aperture, the more dim objects that you're able to see with that telescope. And so you can see I've got a variety here and I'll, I'll get into the reflector in a little bit, but this, this telescope has only a 70 millimeter um, aperture and that would be the minimum that you probably wanna look at. Most people look at say an 80 millimeter or more, 80, 100 or, or more, something like that. So that's the focal ratio, and that's a little bit about aperture. Now, the way you calculate your magnification is you take the focal length of the telescope and just divide it by the focal length of the eyepiece. So if I have a, if I have a 10 millimeter eyepiece, then the power that I'm using when I put that 10 millimeter eyepiece in is 700 divided by 10 or 70 power. So you don't wanna shop for a telescope that, um, advertises that many hundreds and hundreds of power because typically when you're looking at the moon or stars or a planet, you're probably gonna be using only 70 times, 100 times, maybe 200 times. And the higher powers are really only uh, useful when the seeing conditions are good, when the air is steady and not too, not too much distortion. Because as soon as the air gets unstable, you'll be, as soon as you try to magnify an object very much, it'll start becoming blurry. So don't be uh, misled by these wild claims of how many power the telescope works. You, you really only need, you know, uh, 100, 200 power max anyway. And there's actually a rule of thumb with telescopes. The use, the sort of highest useful magnification that you'll want to work with is about 50 times the diameter in inches. So a 70 meter telescope, 70, um, 700, sorry, 70 millimeter telescope aperture, that's about two and a half inches. So you're really only talking about 150 power that you'd ever want to use maximum with a telescope like this. Now, the other thing to look for in these telescopes is the finder scope. 
And I'll get into a little bit, a couple of the other options for finder scopes in a minute. But the other is the, um, the way it's mounted, the tripod. And that's one of the most important ele elements of picking a telescope is to pick a one that has a sturdy tripod. I would rather have a smaller, less powerful telescope on a, on a beefier tripod than the other way around. Because the problem is as soon as you go to focus it, it wobbles and you can't get it, you can't get it to be stable so that you can look through it clearly. Or if you go up to look at it and your eye hits it and it, it shakes like crazy and you can't see anything. So you really wanna, you try to get a, a tripod that's very, very stable, very, very beefy. Um, most tripods have extendable legs and a lot of people think, well, they wanna make the telescope look really big and, and important. So they, they extend the tripod and make it the telescope really high. But actually the telescope's more stable when the legs are short. Now. If you've got a stool or something, you don't mind having the telescope near to the ground like I do right now, that's fine. But if you are, you know, if you are using it when you're standing, just try to lengthen the legs the minimum you can get away with to make it comfortable to use it. Now, this telescope's got um, a slow motion control that lets me turn this little dial and raise it up and down. But if I wanna go left and right, I've gotta physically move the telescope left and right by hand. But I've got a nicer one behind me. So this is the, the telescope here. Wow. How long is this that is one? Still, this is still a bargain telescope. So this would be sort of getting into that $400 range. But you can see that the tripod is much, much heftier. There's a lot of, a lot of mass to the, to the sort of yoke here, the fork here. It's got, around. It's got these slow motion control knobs. So this one lets me rotate the telescope slightly left and right. And this is the one for up and down. And so that lets me actually watch and turn these at the same time and keep the object in the view as the, as the earth turns and the object is carried out of the eyepiece. So this is actually a Celestron telescope, this is a 90 millimeter aperture and the light gathering ability of the telescope scales by the square of its aperture. So do math in my head, this, the 70 millimeter versus the 90 millimeter. So if you take 70 times 70 and you put that as the denominator and you put 90 times 90 as the numerator, I don't know what the math is, but you probably end up being that this telescope's about twice as much get light gathering. Yeah, ability. 490 and 810, I think. I don't know, I'm not a mathematician, but I would assume yeah. that's that's about right. Or- It's easier to do it in inches. So if you have a, a, yeah. a four inch telescope versus a six inch, then it's 16 divided by, um, sorry, it's like 36 divided by uh, 16, which is almost twice as much. So a six inch telescope right. will gather almost twice the light as a four inch telescope. So it really scales that way. So yeah, so you wanna look for the um, slow motion controls on the tripod. And again, the more aperture you want, it, the rule of thumb is you wanna get the biggest aperture that you can afford and carry around because they do get bigger and heavier as they go. Now, here's the cool thing. So this telescope here, is actually an F11. So that 11 number means the field of view is quite small. So if I wanted to see a nice extended object like the Andromeda galaxy or the double cluster in um, of near Cassiopeia, um, I could probably only fit, fit a part of the feature into my telescope. I'd have to sort of pan around to see all of it. But if I selected my telescope to be stubbier, so this is the same aperture as the other one, but this is now an F7.5. So this will give me a bigger field of view. It's also a bit more portable because it's shorter. Um, this is actually an Astronomers Without Borders telescope. I don't know if they still make this one or sell this one, but I bought this used from a, a gentleman who had got it from them. So it's a really good deal. Yeah. So again, Celestron. Refractor telescope. I should ask if we have any questions so far. Yeah, I th if anyone has questions as we go along, please ask them because they will become less and less relevant if you save them to the end. <laughs> so far, so good though. So far, everyone is entranced by the amount of telescope knowledge, the knowledge that you have. <laughs> so both of the telescopes I've shown so far, the tripods, 
they're, they're what we call altitude azimuth. They're altaz mounts. So they, they actually swing up down for altitude and left right for azimuth, right? And this is what we usually recommend that beginners go with. But a lot of people, they want to buy this. Hold on, wait, 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 sorry. There's a question that's relevant. I, oh, wait, okay, you can pull that one over. Pull that one over, but there's a question that's relevant to, to the one that you had there. And that question is from Donna and it's, can you retrofit, retrofit a tripod for slow motion control like those two little knobs that you had? Not usually. No, okay. Not usually. Um, most, of my tele, most of my astronomy gear I've bought used. I think I had one telescope I bought brand new and I've already sold it to someone else who's enjoying or previously enjoyed telescopes. So if you look after your equipment and you outgrow it, then there's no reason why you can't sell it to somebody else or pass it to a friend or relative while you sort of advance in the Titan hobby. Um, so if you find, hopefully we're giving you information that helps you be a smart shopper, but um, if you've made an investment in something that you think you can do better on, then you know, think about selling it or donating it or passing it to somebody and now you know, work up, get something a little better. So what you're saying is telescopes are an investment. They are an investment. And you, can, you, can, you get the money back when you sell it again. So really it's not like you spent that money in the first place. Well, <laughs> so here's the thing. You're buying, if you're spending $150 on a telescope today, um, something's gonna break on it before long. You know, it's probably gonna have a lot of plastic parts. Maybe the focusing knob is plastic or the diagonal is plastic. Um, you take it out into this, out in the backyard in February when it's really, really cold, the plastic gets brittle and, you know, something, something goes on it. At least some of these older ones that I have are, are actually metal and they've lasted a good long time, just why they're still here. Um, speaking of which, this is my telescope from high school. So this Ooh. is my first telescope. I still have it. Um, this is a reflector telescope and I'll, I'll get into um, reflectors in a second here. But the reason I pulled this one up is this has got an equatorial mount on it. So the telescope moves not left, right, and up and down, but it actually moves. Let me see if I can unlatch this here. It has an axis. When you set this up, this axis is meant to be parallel to the Earth's axis of rotation. And that way, when the telescope's lined up with this parallel to the Earth's axis of rotation, once you're pointing at an object, you only need to move one of these knobs to keep the object in view because it's just counteracting the Earth's simple motion in that direction. So what you do is you unlock it in the two directions, get it aimed, lock it in place, and then follow along. This system is very common on department store telescopes. Um, if you ever wanted to do photography, you would need to have an equatorial mount because what an equatorial mount is it rotates the telescope the same way objects cross the sky. So the next time you see the moon rising, notice that the north pole of the moon is to the left. It's rising in the east if you're living in the northern hemisphere. By the time the moon is in the southern sky, it's actually rotated upright. And then when it sets in the west, it's rotated further so that the North Pole is now on the right instead of on the left. And so if you wanted to take a long exposure photograph, not of the moon because it's so bright, but something dimmer, everything in the sky works the same way. The long exposure photograph would see the object rotate in that long exposure. So mounts like this, as they track the object, they rotate the camera and the telescope with the object. And so you don't get that rotating effect. So if you do plan to do astrophotography down the road, you probably want to go for an equatorial mount rather than an altazimuth mount, okay? But most, most beginners think they want to do visual plus, plus photography right away. And so it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a problem because these are a lot harder to use. So to set this up, to make it work properly, you've got to tilt, you, this axis has to be tilted to your latitude on the earth, it has to be set correctly. Um, then you've got to balance, use uh, the, this counterweight here, acts to balance the telescope and the eyepieces to the, to the counterweight. And so 
it can be really tricky. Now, I've seen a lot of people just simply set this to horizontal and just pretend it's all to azimuth. <laughs> <laughs> and you could do it that way, um, but it's not really the way it's designed to be used. It's meant to be just, it's meant to be aligned. Essentially, if you if you zero up this axis and zero up this axis, then the telescope should be pointing at Polaris, basically. Polaris so is, is, that, is that how you would align it then? Yeah, if you're just doing visual, that's generally good enough. You want to sort of level the tripod, um, make sure all the axes are sort of straight up and down and aligned to the sky. And then you just sort of turn the tripod. Actually, there's a little switch here that lets you rotate to put up to put Polaris in your view. And that generally will then let you, once this, once you've got this part aligned, you can unlock the telescope and aim it somewhere else. Say like that. So now if I'm looking at say Arcturus or some star or some object, then I can just follow along by turning one knob only. Right, going. okay. So you can move the entire telescope, but once the mount is aligned, it just follows the Earth's rotation. That's right. So okay. you want to make sure the other thing is that when you're using a mount like this, you got to make sure nobody kicks the tripod because as soon ah. as you kick the tripod, you're out of alignment with, with Polaris and you kind of kind of start all over again. So that hopefully Tom Tom Campbell had a question about lining it up with the Earth's rotation. So hopefully that answers that question. And a quick tip: if you have red glow sticks. You can stick them on the bottom ends of your telescope tripod and hopefully people yeah, won't I kick them at events. <laughs> red lights that I use at star parties. Oh, perfect. So while I'm here, let's just take a look at this telescope. So this one you can see has a parabolic mirror in the base of it. Now the refractor telescopes were adapted for astronomy by Galileo back in 1610. He had heard about these spy glasses that were being used by the Dutch to watch for ships coming and going into the harbors. And he thought, well, if I wanna see things at a distance, maybe I should look up with my spy glass. So he made his own and used, to, used, used lenses. By grinding lenses, he was able to make a spy glass to look up. But within about 50 years, 40, 50 years of that, Isaac Newton came along and realized that he could also accomplish the same goal by focusing light using a curved mirror. So the, these, these reflecting telescopes have a parabolic, very precisely shaped mirror in their base. The light comes in from infinity, goes down to the bottom of the telescope, gets focused by, the, by that mirror and sent back up towards the front of the telescope. Now in the old days, when the telescopes were big, people would stand with their head, with their faces in front and look, look, put an eyepiece here. But Newton got this clever idea to put a mirror inside the tube and send the light out sideways, out to the eyepiece. And so this is called a Newtonian reflector telescope. So the eyepiece goes up here. So the light goes all the way down, comes all the way back, and then is bent with a 45 degree mirror out the side. Now these telescopes, because you're now using mirrors, um, they can reorient the view in a more complex way. So they're not really particularly good for bird watching and that kind of thing, the way, uh, the way a refractor with a star diagonal is. All right, so let's move over to this big one over here. All righty. Also folks, I have seen your questions in the comments about buying used telescopes and all that sort of stuff. Um, and the ones that are not specifically relevant to exactly what Chris is talking about now, I promise I will ask them at the end, um, just so as to keep the flow going. And now one of my favorite types of telescopes. I think these are so cool. So this is called, just fix my gear. This is a Newtonian reflector telescope. Again, you've got your little sub. When you look at it, when you look at the moon in this telescope, there's so much more aperture that you're gathering so much more light that the moon will definitely blind your one eye temporarily. It's say if it's a full moon, if you look at it through this, um, this telescope. So one thing you can do is you can just let 
only that amount of moonlight into the telescope to make it dimmer. Now, the increased aperture of a telescope actually buys you more light, but it also buys you more resolution. So you can actually see um, more detail in objects if you have a larger aperture telescope. And so you could, in fact, say, look at the moon. Oh, that's a fake one. Hmm. I'll take this off. So it's the same principle. Light goes down the tube, gets, gets bounced back to the front, and then redirected out the side. Um, this part, this um, secondary mirror, as it's called, um, sends the light out the side to where the focuser is and to where the eyepiece is. Now, the mounting of this telescope is what's called a Dobsonian mount. And it's named after a gentleman named John Dobson, who just died a few years ago. And he was a bit of an um, astronomy outreach evangelist. He, would, um, he, was, he was actually, I think he was a Jesuit, but he traveled the state parks in the United States and he would, he would make these telescopes. He would construct these bases. I don't know if you can see the base very clearly here. So the principle of this is that it's got a swivel base that swivels it left and right. So it's altitude azimuth, just like the first one I showed you. So plywood or more advanced things, he would make a base for the telescope to sit in. And, uh, and it's very simple and easy to use. And what's great about these telescopes is once you point them, you just basically nudge them along to follow the object and just tilt them around. And the reflector telescopes in this one, it's a F6. So 1200 divided by 600. 1200 divided by 200, so it's an F6. So that means it's that toilet paper tube, that, that, that wider field of view. So these Dobsonian telescopes are fantastic for beginners because they show such a large patch of sky that it's easy to find the object. They gather so much light that you can see nebulas and galaxies in them that you, that you would have trouble seeing in the, the skinny reflector, the refractor type telescope. Um, the downside is that they take up a lot of room. So if you don't have a significant other that, that minds <laughs> this sitting in your, your, your family room or something like that, um, you might <laughs> buy something smaller. Now, if we do a future session where we get into more advanced telescopes, I'll, um, I'll actually bring in my, my primary telescope, which is a 12-inch collapsible Dobsonian, which is... Um, Thankfully, it comes apart and it sort of stores up a little bit easier. The other solution here, Chris, is just to find a significant other who also likes astronomy. So when you're shopping for a telescope, you also shop for the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this brings up an interesting point. Um, this, and by the way, um, you know, a telescope like this, if I undo these knobs, the telescope tube detaches from the base. So this can ride in the back seat, this can ride in the trunk or maybe the passenger seat. So you can actually, you can actually um, put fairly big Dobsonian telescopes in your car and drive it to the conservation area or the cottage or something like that if you need to. So, you know, we, we recommend that um, if you're serious about astronomy, you wanna kind of invest in the better telescope as early in the process as you can because um, astronomers tend to suffer from something called aperture fever, where um, <laughs> they bought the little skinny telescope, the, the 90 millimeter, the 80 millimeter, and they realize I can't see in galaxies, I can't see nebulas very well, I really need a bigger telescope. So if, if, if one way of avoiding that is to just jump right in with both feet and buy the bigger one to start with. Um, these Dobsonian telescopes, this sort of style is very common. There are several different manufacturers. This is Skywatcher. Um, there's uh, Orion and a few other manufacturers that make these, me and so on. Um, typically you'll see them as, as a six inch mirror. And as I alluded to earlier, so you could buy the six inch version of this or you could buy the eight inch version of this. And the six inch wouldn't be that much smaller than this one, except that eight times eight is 64 divided by 36. That's nearly twice as much 
light gathering ability in this telescope has the six inch version of it, right? Or if you're, you can even buy four inch versions of these. So um, 64 divided by um, 16, that's a factor of four. So an eight inch telescope versus a four inch telescope, you get a factor of four improvement in the um, light gathering ability. Now, the refractor telescopes tend to be assembled and solid units. There's no maintenance. You just need to make sure you, know, you don't get the, uh, the lens dirty and that kind of thing. But the reflector telescopes can require something called collimation. And because you're dealing with mirrors and light bouncing around, the light has to be following a specific path in order to achieve accurate focus at the eyepiece. And so what you'll see in these telescopes let's see, are screws on the bottom. And what's happening is that the big uh, glass mirror that's in the bottom of the telescope sits on a mount and it can actually be reoriented a little bit. And what you can do is um, loosen these screws and adjust them with very tiny amounts to make sure that the light path comes straight down the tube and then it gets sent straight back up the tube to that secondary mirror that's at the front. And so that process is called collimation. Um, that's where joining a club like RASC is so, is so helpful because you'll have, you'll meet um, seasoned astronomers that have special tools for collimation or have practiced doing it. And a lot of times if you buy a, a telescope from you know, um, a department store or some, something, maybe it's been misaligned. And so it's not gonna show you as crisp a view. Um, so one thing, that, one thing that really suffers if the telescope is miscollimated is our views of the planets. So um, what it does is it sort of makes the picture that you get at the eyepiece a little bit fuzzy everywhere. Um, so if you were looking at a single star, the star would not achieve a perfect point. But if you look at a planet, the whole planet would become a little bit fuzzy. And so um, by joining RASC or meeting up with some astronomers that have the tools and the expertise, they can give your telescope a quick once over. It's usually just a couple of minutes just to tweak it and get it, get it working and performing uh, precisely as it needs to. Any questions? There's a question about Dobsonians in general, and I'm really excited about this because it's from Jim. I, Jim, I never figured out how to pronounce your last name. Ray, I assume. His daughter was at the GA last year, and she did a fantastic presentation about yeast growing on Mars. Regardless, he, she just got an 8-inch Dobsonian, um, which is very exciting. And they have two eyepieces, 25 millimeter and 10 millimeter. He's wondering what kind of, what best optics to add to the telescope. Um, what accessories you'd, re you'd recommend, a bag for transporting, anything else, stuff like that, um, and where to find them. Um, okay, so as to where to find them, if you want to deal with a, um, you know, a good reputable astronomy dealer who has both telescopes and accessories, um, there are fewer bricks and mortar shops available these days, but in the sort of greater Toronto area, we have, we're blessed to have um, a, a group called KW Telescope, which is in Kitchener-Waterloo, which is a very good um, shop. We have the Con, uh, ConScope shop um, that is um, near Yorkville, Yorkdale Mall, Yorkdale Mall on Dufferin. Um, uh, we have a gentleman um, who runs a place called Ontario Telescope, which is a, an online. He has a, actually has a storefront now up in uh, Bolton, a uh, Bolton area. So if you will get in touch with Rask or, or, or me or Jenna or somebody, we can actually put you in touch with some of these um, vendors if you want to go to them. You can, you can go to them. You don't, you know, you may not finish, you may not make the purchase there, but at least they'll give you advice, which is free to get, and they can advise you on accessories and so on. Um, yes. All-Star Telescope too, just mentioned by um, Carl in the comments too. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if you go on to, now, in terms of online, um, we have a website that's in Canada called astrobicell.com. And it's a place where people like me who want to upgrade or um, dispose of equipment we're no longer using, will put them on, we'll put used equipment on sale, uh, post ads there, and you can um, take a look there. The nice thing about that is that most of the people selling on that site are known to other astronomers or are, are members of RASC or other astronomy organizations. So um, it tends to be a very reliable place to get used equipment as opposed to Kijiji or Craigslist or 
eBay or something like that where you may not be um, quite so sure. Perfect. There was also a question earlier about where to buy used equipment. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah. Now I want to talk a bit about finder scopes. Let me just bring this around here. So as I said before, um, one of the one of the more challenging aspects of getting a new telescope working is being able to find something through it other than the moon. The moon is dead easy to find through the telescope because you know even if you're off, even if you're not quite pointing at the moon, the moon's light is going to be flooding into the eyepiece, and you sort of just move the telescope to where the light is. Walk into the light. And you'll be able to see the moon through your telescope. But if you want to find a small planet or um, a double star or something tr trickier, then it's helpful to be able to to know where to aim your telescope to get that object in view. And if your telescope has a very narrow field of view, like I, as the ones I showed you at the beginning, that could be a challenge. But the way you overcome that is with your finder scope system. And there's a few different approaches to that depending on. Um, what you get with it and or what you might want to upgrade to. So this telescope here you can see has a mini refractor telescope bolted to the top. And the idea here is that this little telescope sees a much bigger patch of sky. And so the odds of the object that you're looking for being in the field of view are much greater than they would be of the higher power telescope. The trick is that these two telescopes need to be pointed at the same spot in the sky. So if you center the object that you're searching for in the finder scope, then when you look in the eyepiece of the big telescope, it'll be there in, in your view. And so the, the best approach in, the, in that case is to um, start in the daytime and get these two lined up together. So what I usually recommend is that people um, point their, their strong telescope, their powerful telescope at a distant hydropole or a treetop or something that's you can or flagpole something that you can tell that's unique and you can do this in the daytime just as long as you're nowhere near the sun once you've got that object centered in your big telescope then you can see how close your your finder scope is to the to have that same object centered and usually there are crosshairs in this type of telescope so you can see there are little knobs there are little adjustment knobs and these actually push the back of the telescope left and left and right up and down to alter the alignment of the telescope. And so once you've got the main object centered in your eyepiece view and the same object on the crosshairs of the finder scope, then you can use this as your as your sort of selecting tool and then your close up view would be through the big telescope. And if you really want to fine tune the process, uh, put a you know, put a, uh, a low power eyepiece in here. So that's one of your long focal length, big number eyepieces. So you have a less magnification, get these lined up, then swap out, zoom in on the object with the higher power eyepiece so that you're now really narrowing that, that accuracy and then fine tune it. And this is something you can do. Um, if this is never gonna get bumped, you can just do it every once in a while, but it's often a good idea when you're going stargazing to send a, spend a few minutes before it's dark, just getting this tested out, making sure that, that these line up together. Because then once it's dark, you can, you can use this finder scope to find the object. Now, so that's one approach. Now in the cheap telescopes, these little finder scopes can be quite small. Let me just bring one over here. So here's a more typical example. This is actually a six by 30. So it'd be like, you know, 10 by 50 binoculars, this would be a six by 30. And this, has a, this is the crosshairs in it and so on. But you can see that the aperture is pretty small. So the view in this, the brightness of the object would be pretty, pretty faint in here as opposed to a, a bigger aperture finder scope. Um, some of these um, flip the image around. So it's confusing because to find the object, it's, you know, you have to go up one way in this scope, but it's the opposite way in the main scope. This one happens to be um, matched so that it works the same way as the telescope it's attached to. So these are optical finder scopes, and there's always a bit of magnification involved in these. But what most, you know, um, more advanced astronomers tend to use 
are things like this. This is called a Telrad. And what this does is it's got a battery inside and it's got a little window here. And when you turn this on, let's see, I know, let's see if this will work. Can you see that there's... A little bit over. Red. There it is, yeah, there's there. a target. Yeah. There's a bullseye, yeah, it makes a bullseye. And that bullseye gets shines up on this plexiglass panel. And when you look behind it, the bullseye is superimposed onto the sky. And so this is also mounted, aligned with your telescope. And there are actually little knobs here that lets you align the bullseye with the, the direction your telescope's pointing. And so this, is, this is actually does not magnify the sky at all. It's just looking through the window with a bullseye to help you center it up. And the bullseye is designed so that the small circle is a half a degree, which is this large, the size of the full moon. The second circle is two degrees and the outer circle is four degrees. And most star atlases will have a little guide that shows you how the um, Telrad bullseye would match to the star chart in that, in that star atlas. So these are really great. Um, they're really easy to use. They see a lot of patch of sky. Um, you could just sort of sit below them and look up and then you could just move the telescope until the object that you want is centered in the bullseye and you're usually good to go. And you can dial up the brightness up and down and, and do things like that. Now they do need batteries. So that's a little bit of a, an issue, you know, before you drive an hour out to the country, you might wanna make sure your batteries or you have a spare battery in your Telrad, but I highly recommend this. And the other option that a lot of telescopes come with is this thing. Mm. And this is called a red dot finder. And this works in a similar way. When you turn on the light, it shines a red dot in the middle of the little window. I don't have it turned on right now. And then you've got adjustments. There's knobs on the side and the back that lets you align the dot with the telescope so you can match to the sky. And again, this uses a battery as well. So you need to make sure you've got a fresh battery or a spare battery if you want as well. So red dot, Telrad, and optical finder. Any other questions before I? There's a question that I don't quite understand because I think I'm too much of a beginner um, regarding astrophotography from Babak. Can I use a regular a regular finder scope of an eight inch daub as a guide scope with a guide camera? I don't know what a guide camera is. So that's an astrophotography question. That's really um, um, a, a video camera attached to a small secondary telescope that watches the object that you're that you're doing you're creating your astrophoto of and adjust your tracking of your electronic mount to make sure oh. it's on the target um so the the answer is probably uh, but most people end up um getting a dedicated guiding camera or you know a smaller old refractor or something and strapping it piggybacking it onto the big telescope to do that but you know this is optical <laughs> we do just a heads up we do have astrophotography sessions coming up again starting next week um, we're doing two back-to-back -back astrophotography sessions where we're going to go over in detail how to acquire the photos in the first session and then in the second session how to process them um, so for those of you who are interested in astrophotography Paul Owen will be joining us again uh, from New Brunswick so he'll uh, be going over that next session okay so I want to talk a little bit about um eyepieces and eyepiece quality and things like that. And then we, we can talk about filters and things like that if there's time at the end. So when you buy a department store telescope, and that applies to my old high school refract, reflector there, um, it came with eyepieces that look like this. These, when you look at an eyepiece, the metal part is called the barrel, and then the eyepiece, the part you look through is, the, is on the top. And this is called um, a 0.96 inch diameter barrel, okay? And it fits in that telescope. It's the only telescope I have that this will fit in, right? But most um, medium and higher grade telescopes these days, they come with, here's my other one, one and a quarter inches. 
So that barrel is called 1.25. And this 1.25 uh, diameter barrel eyepiece, even though it's not a you know, super expensive eyepiece, it'll fit in a really expensive telescope. So you don't have to match the eyepiece to the telescope. You can have, you could buy a cheap telescope and you could buy better eyepieces. Um, and then later on, you could replace the telescope with a better telescope and sort of bootstrap yourself. But, um, you know, there's always the, the weakest link in the process. So you can have improve your telescope but find your eyepieces are substandard. So you want to improve them and go from there. But when you're shopping, don't buy a telescope that has the one inch, the 0.96 IP barrels. Make sure that it holds the 1.25 because then you're future proof, right? Um, now, if you buy a telescope that comes with eyepieces, you're probably going to sell them as a package, but you might end up buying accessories that go along with your telescope. So, for example, this is a zoom lens. Ooh. So before I talk about the zoom lens, I should talk about this little guy. So this eyepiece has a two inch barrel on it. You said little guy, that thing's giant. Well, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> this eyepiece, as I showed you at the beginning, that's a 25 millimeter focal length eyepiece. And so is this one. Hmm. This is, a, this is a made by Celestron. It's a sort of a lower grade one. This is made by Explora Scientific and it's a two inch eyepiece. And the benefit of the two inch eyepieces is they let more light through, especially at longer, at, uh, longer focal lengths. So if you wanna look for galaxies and things like that, you don't want to your telescope to collect all this great light and then have it be throttled by your eyepiece. You may wanna buy a two inch eyepiece that lets more of that light get delivered to your eye. And so this is an example where you could take the 25 that came with the telescope and then replace it with a more expensive eyepiece later on separate from a separate um, vendor. So this is, this is called a two inch barrel eyepiece. Now, if your telescope, let's grab this here. Let's grab this piece. You want to use this both types of, tele, of eyepiece in your telescope. You can have an adapter that'll convert. So the bottom of this adapter is two inches, but the inside of the adapter is 1.25. Oh, cool. So your telescope of your, if you bought a better grade telescope and it has, this one has a 1.25 right there, but it also has an adapter in it so oh, this, this one doesn't come off. Some of them have, a, have this built in, this adapter built into the telescope. So you can actually put a two inch in it as well. Hmm. I have a question about eyepieces that no one's asked yet, but I'm curious. Um, do, you have, do you have to refocus between switching out eyepieces? Normally, yes, okay. normally, yes. Um, so as, as I said at the beginning, the way that you change the amount that your telescope magnifies the image is by switching the eyepieces. And that means you may want to buy or you know, acquire a range of eyepieces to, so you can magnify objects different amounts. But the one workaround you could do is get a lens, a zoom lens. And this is a zoom eyepiece. And this actually runs from 24 millimeters down to eight millimeters. So it's a factor of three magnification. Um, I think I said at the beginning that the, ma the magnifying is the uh, ratio of the focal length to the focal length of the eyepiece. Now this, this is a higher end eyepiece, um, zoom lens eyepiece. This is a batter Hyperion it's called. And what's cool about this one is it's got a two inch barrel. Now it's a one and a quarter. 
That's so cool. Yeah, so I can actually use it in both. It has its own adapter built in. Yeah. Now, in theory, you could, um, you know, you could keep your eyepiece case uh, less populated by using a zoom lens because this offers you a range, replaces another, a number of other eyepieces. The only downside is that these are more optically complicated and so they can diminish the brightness of objects that you look through them, look through this with. So I would not use this for say galaxies and things like that because it's gonna unnecessarily dim the light of the galaxy that I wanna see. But if I'm using this, uh, if I'm looking at say planets and if I wanna you know, magnify Jupiter or Saturn or something like that or Mars, uh, zoom lenses are a really good option for doing that. And again, you can spend, I should say that you can spend lots of money on eyepieces. Um, there are eyepieces on the market that are $1,000 for a single eyepiece. Um, and they, they do benefits like show you an extremely wide field of view and things like that and have um, special optical coatings that make the image high contrast and pinpoint sharp from, from edge to edge, things like that. Um, so like anything, you can, you can invest in more money in, in the, and upgrade as you go. Any other questions there? Um, there are a couple more questions about eyepieces specifically. One was, um, do you have any tips? I don't, again, I'm not entirely sure what this means. Uh, do you have any tips for positioning your eye to the focusing point? Yeah, so there's, there's actually a, a phenomenon called um, eye relief. And what eye relief is about is how far above the top do you need to put your eye to see the, to see the image? And some telescopes, some eyepieces are designed in a certain way that you need to put your eye very, very close to the glass or in this case to the rubber eye cap mm. to see the image. That could be a problem if you wear glasses because the glasses need to fit in between here and your eyeball. Now, I wear glasses for, um, you know, for reading and things like that, or for great distances. So what I do is when I'm alone, I just take my glasses off and I focus my telescope to my own prescription, if you like. But if you're, if you're at a star party and you have different visitors that have glasses and so on, then that would be, you know, a factor. So you can, you can actually, when you shop for eyepieces, you can pick eyepieces that have what we call a wider range here or more eye relief so that people with glasses can use them or people without glasses can use them. Um, in terms of tips, um, generally you want it, what you want to do is if you have trouble seeing through an eyepiece is, is put the rubber eye guard up and get your eye you know, right against the rubber to start with and see if you can sort of move your head around a little bit. Um, uh, one of the challenges that we have as outreach people in, in RASC and other organizations is that people bring their kids to start parties and not parents don't generally realize that until a child is about grade three or so, they haven't figured out how to use one eye or, or look through a microscope or a telescope. So you'll have, you know, kids looking at the eyepiece like this and, and you know, it's tough these days because you want to be able to take a child's head and reorient them. You're not supposed to, it's tricky, right? It's tricky. Yeah. But um, I usually try to caution parents that, um, you know, they may not see it yet, you know, come back next year. <laughs> <laughs> figure it out next year and, and be able to work that out. Mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if that was the answer to the question or not. But. Uh, I have to remember. That sounds about, that sounds good to me. Um, the, the other thing too, for, for young kids, uh, they're not always great at looking through binoculars, but sometimes binoculars are a little bit more intuitive because they use both eyes. So that's always a good tool for outreach. Um, I have, there are quite a few questions, no surprises here, because we were just talking about how many questions come up when we have these so sorts of things. Sure. Um, <laughs> So uh, do you have a Barlow, uh, I guess it's Barlow extender or Barlow in general, and what do they do and why should you use them? Yeah, so I have a Barlow. Actually, I actually have um, two examples of Barlows here. So what the Barlow lens does is it takes the focal length of your telescope and it artificially doubles it. And as we said at the beginning, the way you calculate how many times you're magnifying the object is you divide the focal length of the telescope um, into the focal length of the eyepiece. So 700 
um, you know, 700 divided by 70 would give you 10 times or 700 divided by 10 will give you 70 times and so on. When you insert a, a Barlow lens first and then the eyepiece, it artificially doubles the length of the focal length of the telescope. So you, you've doubled the magnification of your object. So you could have two eyepieces with your telescope and a Barlow and you get four magnifications. So you have the one each without the Barlow and then each with the Barlow, right? So you've got functionally three, three pieces of equipment but four different magnifications. So um, this one from Orion is a two times. Uh, you can get three X other multiples if you, if you want to do that. Um, this would be maybe 70 or hundred dollars, that kind of thing. It's a 1.25. This one here is from, if you recognize this distinctive green colored lettering, Teleview. Teleview are one of the um, higher end brands of eyepieces. And this is also a Barlow lens, but this one would cost I bought this one used, so I bought, I got it at a discount, but um, brand new, it might be $500 just wow. for the model lens, right? But if you're spending $1,000 for lenses, which I'm not, by the way, um, <laughs> then, then this is not so out of whack. Um, this one will have superior glass in it, superior optics. It's something called parfocal, which means if you put Teleview eyepieces in it, you don't have to refocus between each eyepiece. Okay. So that's a Barlow. Now there's a question about another thing that I don't know about. I'm so glad that I feel very privileged to be able to be here and hearing you talk about all this stuff, Chris. I don't know everything either, but I'll do my best. You're doing great. Um, what is a field flattener? Okay, a field flattener is, all right, so how do we explain this? There's one person in the comments who said <clears throat> that, hold on, it's used for astrophotography to ensure edge to edge performance. Yeah, yeah. The, if you actually do the op the trace the optical path of the starlight or the object's light as it passes through the telescope, you 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 get you come to understand that the picture of the view thing you're viewing doesn't fall on a flat plane, but it falls on a curved surface. And it's just the way it's just the way things work. So what an opt and so if you took a photograph of that at that point in space parts of the photograph would be sharp and the parts on the curved sections would be out of focus. So the field flattener does an extra optical trick to flatten that picture. So make it sharp edge to edge. So that's a I see, thing. okay. Um, you wouldn't need it for any of this visual observing though. Okay. Um, this is a, a, I have no idea about this one. Will the image become dimmer with many eyepieces and Barlow's connected together? Yes. Okay. So um, that's a really funny story. I once, I once saw a telescope advertised on Kijiji and it was, it was one that I was in the market for. And I saw that in the, in the photo, in the ad, they had attached everything under the sun that came with that telescope to it. They had the Barlow on and the eyepiece on. And, and so they, it, you'll see this in ads on Kijiji and, and things like that a lot where it makes the telescope look bigger and longer. But in practice, you would never use it that way because you would be just adding, you know, uh, dimming light over dimming light over dimming light. So, so okay. yeah. So, so the, the, short end, the short answer is if you find yourself using um, a Barlow all the time, then maybe you should consider just buying the right eyepiece to replace that Barlow plus eyepiece combination. Because okay. obviously you're getting more serious and you might be, um, you might be worth investing in that. That's, I guess that's a kind of a nice thing about eyepieces too, is that if you invest in good eyepieces, they last between telescopes as long as you have the same. Yeah, exactly. Same attachment. So it's an investment folks. Um, there've, there've been a couple questions that Leon, thank you for answering them are in the Q and A and I'll, I'll throw them out there, Chris, to you in case you have any extra stuff that you want to add. Mm -hmm. um, one is about seeing the surface of Jupiter. Rick has an eight inch reflector. Um, he was asking how much you'd need to spend to be able to see details or of, on the surface or shadows on Jupiter's moons. Leon said that you should be able to be to do that just fine with an eight inch reflector um, with a six to 10 millimeter eyepiece or so. Yeah. Does that sound that's about right? Exactly true. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And so that's done. And then, okay. Uh, there's a general, sorry, while I interpret this question, I have another question. Where'd you get your shirt? 
<laughs> Everyone wants to know where you can order Rask Toronto Centre shirts. So this is not just merely a Rask Toronto Centre shirt. This is actually a DDO volunteer shirt. Ah. So the, the Toronto Centre operates programs at the David Dell Lab Observatory. And, um, and we're one of several partners that offer astronomy um, uh, programming at the DDO. And Richmond Hill, who own the telescope now, have asked that we be branded when we're doing programs there for our front sort of our public facing aspect. And so um, if you join the Toronto Centre, uh, you can join the operating team that works the telescope at the DDO and maybe, uh, maybe get to use it, the big telescope. And then you that, get a shirt. I, that, Chris, you're going to see me out there sometime helping you guys out. So, first of all, the shirts are amazing. And second of all, that telescope is fantastic. That telescope is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm one of the operators on the operating team there. And, um, and I've trained up uh, a number of people sort of two summers ago, and we're getting ready to train a new batch. Um, now, I, I should say before everybody, <laughs> many, many, many will apply, but it's like the right stuff. Um, it's a 1930 vintage telescope with no safety um, controls on it. In other words, there's nothing preventing you from crashing the telescope into the side of the building. Um, you need to be trained, you need to be, you know, have the right stuff to not crash the telescope. So, so it's a big expensive people, historical lots telescope. Why don't you want to operate, but not everybody gets <laughs> the golden the golden ticket. That makes sense. That's totally yeah, fair. I'm happy, but I'm happy to teach you how it works and, and give it a try, you know? Okay. Um, so there's a question about uh, high power binoculars. They're 20 by 80 and usually those numbers mean 20 times magnification and 80 millimeters. Is that what, you, is that, what that means? Yeah, so the 80 is the aperture, just like the aperture of the, of the refractor telescopes. So 80 would be bigger than... <laughs> Than my little friend here. This is wow. 70. 80 is bigger than this. Big old binoculars. And then the 20x is the magnifying power. So they've taken they've taken that focal length focal ratio and they've already done the math to, to tell you that the the eyepiece that's in the binoculars gives you a 20 time magnification. So 20 times 80. So for for astronomy, um, what's important is uh, more aperture means you can see dimmer things but it also means it's bigger and heavier. Right. So you may be then looking at tripod mounting it or something like that. So that's exactly what this question was getting to, which is talking, I think he, he mentioned a parallelogram mount. I don't know what that is. Um, I've seen someone, um, Linda Palaya from Sudbury using a mount where you can like yeah. sort of collapse it. So let me, um, let me I actually, have, um, um, we um, in Toronto Center, we run the NOVA program, New, New Observers to Visual Astronomy. And I have a PowerPoint here that I've used for that class. I'm just going to run through some highlights of this, of this slideshow, and I'll show you a parallelogram. It's okay. So if it'll take you a second to get it up, I will just verbalize something that I wrote in the chat, which is, although we don't have Chris's fantastic shirt, we do have other RASC national branded shirts available, and the link is in the chat. Um, it'll be in the link in the YouTube description once we finish wrapping up here. Um, if you would like to buy those there, you can buy them from T-Shirt Elephant. We have the word more common. So there's a, pal a parallelogram now. And it just means that one end of the parallelogram is on the tripod and the other end has the, the binoculars and then there's a counterweight that helps uh, you know, uh, balance it out. Uh, here's another way, another approach to it. So you're not actually supporting the weight of the binoculars with your hands. You're just using the parallelogram to, um, to take care of that. And the parallelogram just means that the, the wood is jointed so that you can, you can push the binoculars left and right and they'll stay put. Cool, okay. Um, I'm gonna throw you one more question while I run and grab binoculars and throw out a quick advertisement for them. Um, and that's from Jim again. Do you have any advice uh, to beginners for taking care and maintaining your telescope? Um, is dew and moisture a risk for Dobsonians? And are there strategies to mitigate the dew and moisture? Yeah, so um, we're out of that season now, but um, when I teach this course, I like to let people know about how to deal with cold weather. So your best 
the, a telescope like a refractor has the air sealed up inside it, basically. And so um, if you take a warm telescope out into the cold, um, the cold air hitting the telescope tube is going to create eddy currents distur disturbing the air that's the warm air that's inside the telescope tube. And so the best advice if you're planning on stargazing in cold weather is to set your telescope outside and let it get cold uh, for an hour or two ahead of, of your observing time. Um, the Dobsonian telescope, the reflecting telescopes, don't have as much of an issue because the air is open to the sky and it can circulate. But you do tend to have a heavy glass mirror in the bottom, which if you take a warm glass mirror out into the cold, it's going to try to cool down while you're observing. And depending on uh, the shape of the mirror, you could end up with odd distortions in the shape of the mirror while it tries to get cold. And so your best advice, even for a reflector, is to also put it outside and let it get cold as well. Now, when you're doing that, you want to keep all the caps on, right? So let you, you can put the reflector outside with the cap on for a couple of hours, maybe in the garage, maybe in the trunk of your car, if you don't have a secure neighborhood where you could leave it outside, just to let it get cold. Then when, you're, when you head out there, you can do your observing for a few hours, whatever you want to do. And it's going to get chilled right down to whatever the temperature is. So if it's February, it's minus 18, whatever it is that you're dealing with. If you take your telescope from the minus 18 and bring it into your house, it's going to get soaked with water and dew right away. So what your best advice is to, while you're still outside, put all the caps on. If you have a case, lock it in the case, bring the case in the house, and don't open it until, the, until tomorrow morning. And then it'll all be acclimatized back to, to short sleep temperatures by then. Um, if you don't have a case for your telescope, put the caps on, maybe put a green garbage or a plastic garbage bag or something over it, put an elastic, just let it, to prevent additional air from getting into it and, bring, and carrying more moisture onto your telescope. Uh, same, I mean, photographers know the same thing. It's the same thing, you know, they've got expensive lenses, they just cap them up and let them, um, you know, in their case, warm up and before they open it. And then the next morning, you just open the case up and let it sit open and any residual moisture can, can come out. Um, in terms of maintenance on telescopes, the reflector needs occasionally collimating it might need. Um, people do once in a while clean their mirrors, but um, a little bit of dust on your mirror will only reduce the amount of throughput of the light by a few percent at most. And so it'll be slightly less efficient, but you will not need to fuss or worry if you see a little bit of dust on your reflector mirror. Um, um, most people would say, just don't worry about it. Don't touch it. Um, you can, um, if you know what you're doing or have a RASC friend that knows what they're doing, disassemble your telescope. You can clean these mirrors with distilled water and, um, and rinsing agents and things like that. But you know, it's, it's the heart of your telescope. So you really need to know what you're doing if you're going to do that. Um, as far as um, reflect, refractor telescopes, you know, never try to put your fingers on the objective lens. Um, if you do, um, you can use distilled water or um, filtered, uh, some people use filtered Windex and they just uh, dampen a Q-tip and lightly drag it across the surface. Don't, don't, don't scrub because you could scratch the coatings and things like that. But um, generally you let it get a little dirty, you don't worry too much about it. It shouldn't hurt things too much. Um, this picture that, I, can you see this picture? Yes, we can. So this is the difference between um, a department store telescope and the one from a reputable vendor. So what happens in, um, in cheap, inexpensive refractor telescopes is that the light gets focused by the objective, but all the different colors get focused different amounts. And so you mm -hmm. get fringes of color around bright objects. You can see the moon here as a red top and a blue bottom. Whereas in a more expensive telescope, and this Celestron one that I showed at the beginning, has advanced glass in its objective and it keeps the colors together and so it gives you a higher fidelity color image. So that's an, that's an example of why you'd want to spend a little bit more for the telescope. So if your budget's, you know, if your budget's $200 or, or $300, maybe see if you can contact an astronomy club and find someone that's going to sell you a $600 at half price used because if you go into the store and spend that money on a 
on a telescope, you're probably going to get, they've cut corners somewhere. So I'd, you know, I'd be leery about that. And that's now is a good opportunity to um, just mention something that Maury Portnoff, who uh, is the past president of Montreal Centre, mentioned over on the YouTube channel, um, which is always do your best to support your local stores. Um, there's, I mean, this happens in everything, especially uh, this, uh, this has recently been happening with um, Henry's, which had to close a couple of stores, a couple of its camera store locations, where folks will go into the store, ask for advice, and then go buy online. Um, as much as you can, supporting local stores is really, really a nice thing to do. Um, so if you can, and if you have a telescope store nearby, don't just go to them for advice, make sure that you go in and, and actually spend your money there um, yeah. to support them. One more thing also is that, um, and I, this may be true in other centers across the country, but in, in the Toronto Center, um, these telescopes, we have a loan program. This, is, this, is, this one's owned by RASC, Toronto Center. Um, and you can borrow scopes like this and try them out and you can decide what's the best fit for you. Uh, maybe for a two week, two week period, something like that. So a lot of rest centers have that. So if yep. no matter where you are in the country, if you're looking at buying a scope, but you're not sure what you want or how things work or what you like, definitely check out Rask centers first, uh, and go and try a bunch of different scopes. A lot of places do have, a lot of our centers do have telescope loan programs. So definitely worth taking advantage of. Um, just back to collimation for a second. This, this is a slide from the, from the presentation that I had. This just shows you an example of the difference caused by your reflector telescope being out of collimation. And if you wanna, if you wanna test your telescope, the best way to do it is to put a high power eyepiece in your telescope, aim it at a star, don't aim it at Saturn, but aim it at a star and defocus it a little bit. And so you turn the pinpoint of the star into a disc. And in a reflecting telescope, you should see uh, a well collimated reflector will give you a symmetrical disc, but one that's out of out of collimation will give you an offset. So you can see there's a there's a pinch side and a wider side, and this is an indication that those those screws at the base of the telescope need to be tweaked just a slight amount to bring this into collimation. And the effect of especially planet views would be say sharp views versus a generally um, inferior view. So, you know, don't, don't dump your telescope because you think it's not working well. Maybe get a RASC friend to take a look, you know, especially once social distancing has ended. And maybe it just needs tweaking. Maybe it's perfectly great telescope. It just needed some, some TLC. Perfect. Okay. Sounds great. I am far too nervous to collimate my own telescope. So I'm very glad to be part of an organization full of people who can help me with this. Um, there's a question from Mateo in... The, uh, in the YouTube chat, which was when you're talking about NOVA programs, um, I don't think you'll have the answer to this necessarily, but do you know when, when we would normally offer them and when we might start offering them again? I, I think in the Toronto Center, we were running them twice a year, sort of spring and fall, um, but they won't, they won't start up again until libraries reopen and places like that. So just yeah. have to stay tuned. And we may, I'm not going to say anything official, but we may, we don't have the NOVA program, but we may be running something else that'll help with uh, some startup observing folks who are interested in learning how to observe. Yeah, and, and this insider's guide is meant to sort of help with a bit of NOVA. Um, and really, if there are topics that people are keen to explore, you know, how to use a star atlas, um, we talked about astronomy apps and things like that. There's lots of things we can do that are part of NOVA that we could cover in our sessions together. For sure. So that might be a direction we can go to. Um, just a, a note from Maury as well in Ottawa, not Ottawa, sorry, Montreal Centre. Um, they have a loan program as well. And once COVID is settled down, they will help, they, they will gladly help non-members with telescopes. And oftentimes a lot of RASC centers will help non-members uh, regardless. So um, if you are interested in, in getting help with your telescope, especially once this is all done and we can do outreach again, um, feel free to just contact me uh, and you can always, I'll do my best to hook you up with people who will help you out near your center. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, oh, hold on. There's a few little minor, oh, we do have technically, so we end at five o'clock now. Um, I'm so glad everyone's enjoying it so far. We do have a few more minutes and I wanted to um, mention, I was wondering if you could talk briefly about filters because we have two questions. Um, one of them is uh, how would you mitigate light pollution in the city? Okay. And that seems filter related. So light pollution filters tend to be more um, a 
applicable to astrophotography than visual astronomy. But let me just, um, I should have a slide in here that's got filters in it. There are 176 slides in this. My goodness. There is actually, while you're sorting through those, there is a question uh, about whether or not you can share that presentation. Um, I'm not sure if that's something you want to do because it's your uh, intellectual property, but um, if not, it looks like it's the presentation for the NOVA program. So you can always go and join Toronto Center's yeah, NOVA program. There, there's a, there is actually a, um, it's about a 10 page PDF of all the content that um, we could get to people if they're interested in getting it from us. Okay, so I will then, uh, maybe Chris, I can get that from you and I'll put it in the YouTube description and I'll send out the link at the next session. Does that work for you? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right, we'll do that. So it, it has things like the, the formula for magnification and, and lots of little you know, things I mentioned. So yeah, you can use, you can use color filters to enhance um, aspects of the planets, which are the most applicable um, use of color filters. So you could do things like separate out the you know, the oranges and so on on Mars to, to, uh, to show the lights and darks a little bit better or maybe show the bands of Jupiter a little bit more distinctly. Um, I don't typically work with uh, color filters very much. A lot of um, eyepiece kits come with a basic set of, uh, of color filters, but I haven't found them all that useful in my astronomy, but other people might be um, more keen on having them. Uh, what I do use a lot is this. This is a, a neutral density filter. We talked about this, I think, uh, recently, where if you're viewing the moon and you've got a bigger aperture telescope and you're finding the moon is blinding you, you can attach um, a polarized glass filter to your eyepiece and you can actually dial the amount of um, the filtering that it does. Let's see if I have it here. Yeah. So depending on the phase of the moon, you can make it put all the light through or very little light through. Let's see if I can make this work. I'll stop sharing for a second so you can see it. All right. So. Is that working? Yeah, there it goes. Yeah. yeah. There it is. Yeah, yeah. We can make the moon dark or, or light. Yeah. And this just, this has threads that screw onto the bottom of the eyepiece. So most of these eyepieces, the barrel, when you take the cap off the barrel, it has threads, oops, that let you screw the threads to the bottom. Now, this is a two inch neutral density, but you can also buy the 1.25 for the other type of eyepieces. So that's very, very handy for the moon. It's also very handy for Jupiter and Venus because they're so bright. Let me just go back to sharing my screen. Uh, where'd my eyepieces and my filters go? Yeah. Um, here's a list, and this is in the handout that I talked about. Um, the reason, all the various colors that you might use to do different things with the planets. Um, in terms of deep sky objects, so you can get um, most nebulas. We talked in our um, in our deep sky insider's guide session about the types of nebulas. You can have nebulas that are emission nebulas that are glowing with uh, the hydrogen wavelengths, uh, hydrogen color wavelengths, and you can have reflection nebulas, which are scattered starlight. And you can buy special filters that actually let through the light from the nebula and throw away all the other lights so that you're throwing away the light pollution light and the other uh, reflected, reflected sunlight light, and things like that. So it'll actually boost the contrast between the glowing nebula and the background sky. So you can see them a little bit um, better. Um, the most common ones that people use are oxygen three. Uh, let's see. Um, H alpha is more for the sun, H beta is for other nebulas. They so also oh, use sulfur, oh, right? And, um, and another one, basically um, nebula filter or light pollution filter for optical use, you can look at there. So we, for um, just for folks who are interested with the robotic telescope we have in California, we use um, hydrogen alpha, oxygen three and sulfur two. Um, as our filters. And then that allows us to cut out, uh, the oxygen does um, uh, cut, it doesn't cut out, it's, that's right around the, the, the wavelength that the moon produces. So unless you get a really, really, really narrow filter, 
Um, if you get a really narrow filter, you can cut down the light from the moon. Um, and then hydrogen alpha does a really good job of cutting out light pollution as well. Yeah, so this slide is an example of um, a nebula with and without a nebula filter. Just said it darkens the sky around it and enhances the filter. So it's something that you could invest in if you're keen to look at that kind of object with your scope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I think that covers all of the questions that we've had. I'm pretty sure. So today I just talked about manual mounts, um, entry level telescopes. If folks are keen on looking at uh, computerized telescopes, go to telescopes, things like that, we can plan a session down the road and get a little deeper into more expensive but more powerful systems. Sounds good. I'm going to wrap up with a couple uh, comments. First of all, since we're reaching the end of or after the next two sessions, which are both on astrophotography. So if you're interested in astrophotography or you know anyone who's interested in astrophotography, tell them to register. Um, so that'll be happening uh, May, hoo -hoo, May, I've lost track of the time, next week and the week after on Tuesday um, with Paul Owen. We're so excited to have him. Um, once we hit that, we're going to take a little bit of a break. We're going to take two weeks off at the beginning of June, and then we're going to come back again and get started um, with another round of more stuff that's going on. So at that point, I will send out more uh, another survey to let you guys know what else we're planning on doing and what see what you guys are all interested in, uh, in seeing. And then we'll throw out another uh, schedule of stuff that we're gonna do. So that's a little bit up in the air, but that's happening, gonna be happening at the end of June, uh, middle end of June. I wanted to mention as well that Astronomy by the Bay is doing another series also on beginner telescopes. So if you're looking for more perspective, um, or other uh, opinions. They're running that series over on Astro by the Bay's YouTube channel. I just sent the link in the chat. Fantastic folks, they're from New Brunswick and they're also RASC members. They do a live show every Sunday night. So they also will sh uh, occasionally show the sky. It's great. They're, uh, huh, I wrote RASC parties. I'm not sure what that means, but if uh, I do recommend as the, as the um, social distancing uh, restrictions lift a little bit, the best experience you can get with the new telescope is going out to RASC star parties and, and meeting other astronomers and learning from them. So in-person stuff really does help. And I will also throw out that we sell these binoculars on, I believe it's the Sky News website. You can find them on our website. Um, they're eight by 56. So they catch a lot of light and are a slightly wider field, um, but they allow you to see a lot of stuff. These are the only observing tool I have and I love them. Um, so they're worth, they're worth the investment. I really like binoculars. Uh, it's worth a shot. And finally, I'm just going to reiterate that supporting your local store. Definitely, uh, definitely support those local telescope shops. Make sure they keep their doors open. All righty. Uh, <laughs> Phil says we only have a few pairs of these left on the Sky News site, so act now. You can buy an attachment that fits in uh, to hold it on a tripod if you're interested in that sort of thing. Chris, do you have any final thoughts on anything? Um, thanks for everybody tuning in. Uh, well, as I say, we'll have a break. I'm going to be uh, hoping to find some dark skies next week because we've got another round of galaxy season um, for the next uh, about 10 days. And then we'll be back. And if everybody's keen for us to continue, we can take a virtual tour of the Southern Hemisphere. We can look at safe solar observing. I've got some cool gadgets, <laughs> some of which you can make at home for safe solar observing. We can look at science fiction and astronomy. I think that's a cool one. I don't, oh, I don't wow. really care if anybody else wants to hear about that. I want to talk about it. So we're going to talk about sci-fi and astronomy. <laughs> and, and we've been promising to cover planets for a long time. We will do that. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a bit, a bit of time yet before uh, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are visible in the evening sky. So we're in no hurry. But, um, but yeah, if you are enjoying this, let us know uh, what you're keen for us to do, and we'll keep going. Awesome. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. So glad to see your enthusiasm. I'm so glad to see enthusiasm for sci-fi as well. Hooray. Um, and we'll see you all next week for astrophotography. Chris, we'll see you in a little while. Enjoy your dark skies. Thank you. Keep looking up. Keep looking up. Have a good, uh, have a good long weekend, everybody coming up. Take care. Take care.